let's start um, our second day of the electronic symposium of uh, uh, on protistology. So welcome everyone. Um, we we would like to thank uh, all the speakers uh, from yesterday, from today, everyone that's joining us. Um, if you missed your presentations from yesterday, Andreas, can you go to the next one? Thank you. So if you missed your presentation from yesterday, uh, if you missed the presentation from yesterday, you can go to the YouTube ch channel, uh, the same that uh, you probably have visited before, Protest Online. Uh, and as you can see with the red arrows, uh, we have already uploaded the videos from yesterday, so you, you can just uh, watch it. And from today, we'll be uploading uh, after the meeting as well. And we are also very pleased to announce today. Uh, can you go to the next one? <laughs> okay, so we are also very pleased to announce today the online poster section uh, on Prochist. So if you are looking to, to a place where you can present your work, uh, please check uh, this um, uh, address, contact Lucas, and we're going to give a bit more information at the end, but keep in mind that you have this platform and this uh, opportunity to present your work as a poster, which is very great. Um, so without uh, further ado, Let's go to a few reminds uh, about the Zoom again. So please uh, mute your microphone when the presentations start. Uh, stop your video so we don't charge so much the, the internet. Um, if you have questions, you can raise your hands uh, electronically. Uh, you wait for the chair. He will um, allow you to speak and then you can introduce yourself and ask your question. You can also uh, pose your question on the chat, and then we will uh, address the que your question to the speaker. Okay, so let's start. I will pass the word to uh, Andreas. No, you are introducing the first speaker. You are introducing Miguel. Let me just stop sharing this. So yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our first speaker today. Miguel Frada. Uh, Miguel, he holds a senior lecturer position at the Institute of Life Sciences in the, of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He's also a resident at the sci a resident scientist at the Inter-University Institute for Marine Sciences in Elat. And his research focuses on understanding uh, physical and biological processes that regulate microbial plankton dynamics in the ocean with a focus in phytoplankton life cycles and, inter and biotic interactions. I'd just like to remark the quite unique and highly interdisciplinary research program that Miguel does, which combines knowledge from molecular biology, ecology, and oceanography, and works across scales from cellular processes up to ecological processes, ecosystem processes, sorry. And today he will be talking about the uh, life cycle strategies in marine phytoplankton in relation to spatial temporal dynamics, biotic interactions, and cellular responses of a bloom forming phytoplankton. So, thank you very much, Miguel. Thank you very much for your presentation. And thank you very much for the organizers, especially Adriana, that uh, invited me directly to give this lecture. So, thank you. Uh, should I share my screen or is it already shared? No, you, you can share it. <coughs> I can. Okay, so, so again, uh, good morning to everyone. As Andres said, I, I'm a resident scientist in, uh, in the Hebrew University in Israel. And I will be presenting uh, uh, a story that I've been carrying for some time. And uh, so part of the, what I'm going to show is not necessarily new, 
but part it's new, it's unpublished data, and I want to share uh, that with you. So, um, yeah, I, most of the work I, I've been developing over the last years uh, uh, concerns the, the coccolithophores, which is a, a group of the aptophytes that you can see in this tree. Uh, of the lineages of the optophytes and coccolithophores, as you can see in this uh, SCM picture, are these uh, single celled calcified microorganisms. Uh, uh, so the cell is encased in this uh, uh, com uh, complex and, and, and uh, composite exoskeleton made of coccolithes that are uh, built of uh, calcium carbonate. And they have a, a cosmopolitan distribution overall, and they are important primary producers, but mainly important uh, pelagic calcifiers, contributing a large fraction for the calcification in, in the oceans. And uh, <clears throat> particularly in the cocotophores, I'll be focusing today in one single species, which is Emiliania axley that you can see in this image, which is a cell more or less of five microns, but is uh, currently the most prevalent cocotophore in the world's ocean. And one of the particular features of Emiliania Axley is the formation of uh, large scale blooms um, that have called a lot of attention from various uh, fields of science to understand the, the formation, demise, and also the dynamic and, in, and biogeochemical impact. And as you can see in this uh, picture on the left side, this is an image taken from satellite. Uh, uh, and, and as you can see, the water where these blooms developed, this is an image from the north of Norway, uh, become uh, lighter due to the light scattering by the, the, plate, the calcium carbonate plates of these, uh, of these cells. And so this is a use, useful tool because then you can map as you can see in this uh, right side map, uh, the, where these blooms uh, develop because they have this distinct signature. So you can study the spatial temporal dynamics of these blooms. And as you, as you can see, this is a composite over one year. They are very important in uh, high latitudes, both in the northern and, and southern hemispheres. And uh, what, there are many aspects that we don't understand very well of, of these blooms, particularly the, the, form, the, 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 the initial stages of this bloom are still uh, largely debated. What, what are the key triggers for these blooms, which normally happen uh, in late spring, early summer, as the uh, uh, thermocline starts developing. But there is still a lot of debate trying to understand what, what clearly triggers these blooms. But one thing that we know maybe better is how these blooms are terminated. We know that predation plays a role, possibly also pathogenic bacteria also play a role, but we know for sure that uh, specific viruses are very important in the demise of these blooms. And recently they have been considered as the main players in the demise of these blooms. And what you can see here in the left side is a, a TEM cross-section of a cell you can see the, the coccolites around the cell. The calcification is intercellular, so you can see here a coccolite inside of the cell that will, be event that will have been eventually extruded to form the exoskeleton. But you can see here this pack of virus infecting the cell. Okay, these are, uh, they are called Emiliani Axley virus, HV. It's a large double strand DNA virus with nearly 200 nanometers of diameter. Uh, belongs to the FICO DNA viridae group. It has nearly 500 genes. It has, it's, it's, it's a big virus. And, uh, and as you can see in this figure in the, in the left side, uh, in the right side, uh, this is not necessary. The culture flask, but provides a good uh,
stimulation of cells, dead cells, uh, labeled with a cytox screen, which is a, a probe for, for a, dead, a, a death marker, as well as the expression of caspase activity that is involved in the regulation of the cell death during viral infection. And there is a wide array of studies that you can see in these uh, other papers uh, developing the understanding of, of the disinfection and how the virus uh, uh, uses the host to, to manipulate his cell death and control his cell death and demise. And so we understand very well that the virus are critical in this demise. So this is an important factor of, of this talk. Another aspect that interlinks with, with this viral infection is the life cycle of this uh, Emiliani Huxley. So Emiliani Huxley, like uh, uh, as far as we know, all coccolithophores uh, or all the aptophytes actually, they have a haplodipontic life cycle with at least two phases that, that we recognize today and uh, one diploid and one haploid. And these phases tend to be highly heteromorphic. So the, uh, to, start, to, to an extent that uh, uh, different phases have been assigned different, different uh, uh, taxonomic affiliations because they are totally different. And slowly, low, slowly they have been linked through the finding of, 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 of cells in, in, the, in transition or cultural experiments. So in the case of Emiliana Huxley, the bloom forming phase as far as we know, is diploid, is diploid phase and is calcified. But we know from culture studies that they are able to form a haploid stage that is non-calcified and is flagellate. Okay, uh, that would look like at, at the, under the light microscope, like almost any other photosynthetic flagellate that you see in a, in a drop of water. Very hard to distinguish. In contrast with the diploid phase that we due to calcification is quite distinct. And uh, while the diploid phase we know a lot in, in nature, the haploid phase we have nearly no information of the, the, the natural history. Okay, and uh, already during my PhD, while playing with uh, Emiliani Huxley and the virus, I found that uh, the, while the, the, the diploid phase is sensitive to this EHV that kills the blooms. And you can see here a culture flask with a control against uh, infection where the culture gets cleared. The haploid phase is completely insensitive to the virus. The, uh, we don't know exactly why, but uh, multiple experiments across multiple host and viral strains did not show any type of uh, infection or, or even a response by the cells to the presence of virus. So they seem to be completely insensitive, uh, most likely due to lack of some uh, receptor or there is no information. I, I don't have any insight that there is some antiviral activity whatsoever. It seems more that uh, the virus is just unable to, to, uh, to, to absorb to, the, to these cells. But it's still... Uh, point to, to, to further explore. So there is a difference, uh, not only morphological, we have other indications of strong physiological differentiation, and this is another difference. They show different response to viral infection. The diploid sensitive and the haploid insensitive to the virus, or resistant to the virus. And another interesting aspect of this interaction is that this has been, uh, uh, this was done in the lab, so you can see here uh, an infection, and the white dots are control, and then the, gray, the, the light gray dots, the dark uh, triangles are the virus, the light gray, uh, uh, gray circles is the infection diploid culture. You, you can see that most of the cells are uh, removed by the virus, and after a certain time that often varies between experiments, uh, between seven to, to two weeks, uh, seven days to two weeks, the, the, the culture is able to re-emerge. And uh, uh, 
in uh, several strains, this reemergence of cells, uh, the, the cells that reemerge are not calcified anymore. They are rather uh, flagellate, as you can see in these images. So uh, that looking like haploid cells. So it seems that at first that the, the, this viral infection maybe triggers life cycle transition, uh, enabling the form or, or or, and the cell, a few cells form this flagellate state that is insensitive to the virus. And this could be probably a strategy to uh, escape viral infection and, and uh, keep an inoculum of cells that would be able to reinitiate new, new populations. So maybe a strategy for viral ev evasion. Uh, an interesting... Uh, so the, this was the thought for, for several years that uh, we were witnessing a, trans, uh, a diploid to haploid transition, but further cellular work in the lab showed that this is not uh, clearly the case. So when we do uh, the, when we follow the genome size of cells across an infection, we see that during the reemergence, the the size, the average size of the of the genome of cells uh, does not drop to half as it would expect it, as it, as if uh, that you would expect if there was a deploy to haploid transition, but they actually maintain the same size and and maybe maybe even increase slightly, and this might may, maybe this increase may be due to some noise because we are measuring a very little amount of cells. Actually, when we now isolate these re-emerging cells post-infection, indeed we see that they have big genome size, maybe even slightly bigger than the diploid. And they, they are also much bigger in terms of volume. So this is the haploid that we use as a control to measure the genome size. This is the real deployed, the calcified one. And these are several strains of these re-emerging cells. So they, are, they have a big genome and they, are also, they have also a large volume. And so, although they look like uh, the haploid cells, so they are non-calcified and flagellate, they retain a big genome and they are also bigger and then more work using microsatellite markers uh, could recognize that so this is the diploid the haploid you can see for this marker there are two loci for which the diploid is heter uh, heterozygotic for the haploid of course we just see one one of the bands for these two loci and all the flagellates are heterozygotic as well like the diploid so this shows that these cells although looking like haploid they remain deployed and uh, there was uh, uh, instead of a sexual transition there was some sort of morphological remodeling that was decoupled from the life cycle so for that reason we call these cells the decoupled cells decoupling between phenotype and the ploidy life and so the life cycle of uh, emiliani axley uh, rather than being solely composed of two phases the deployed and the haploid we now recognize that it's, there is a third stage that is deployed flagellate, the decoupled stage, that is a form at least so far uh, under uh, viral pressure. We don't, we have some insights that it might be formed under other conditions, but proven, we just know that they are formed under viral infection. Uh, and maybe not across all strains. Some strains are able to so there, there, there seems to be a third component which makes this life cycle more complex than, than, than we thought. Of course, now one of the uh, missing aspects of this understanding this life cycle is, is uh, not only uh, the triggers for the, the regular sexual process. We still don't know what triggers meiosis. We still don't know what triggers sexual syngamy. We are not able to manipulate it in lab conditions. Uh, but now we have other possibilities that we also don't understand uh, what might, uh, well, this one we understand, but is there an option for these cells to, to revert? 
do these cells if they revert they, they revert back to a diploid state or they are an intermediate state between the diploid and haploid, some sort of uh, uh, planar zygote of dinoflagellates or, or that, uh, that mediates the transition between diploid and, uh, and haploid phase. So these are open questions. And so far this, this uh, material has been published, but we know now that we can answer at least one of, one of these questions. So maintaining these cells in culture over uh, already a few years, we, we observed that after some time in culture, these uh, decoupled cells, they start shifting back. So now they are uh, without virus, so they, there is no viral pressure due to subculturing, for sure the virus was uh, washed away. So now they are uh, isolated and we see that, that they tend to revert back to the calcified state, okay? And you, this was first identified in, in flow cytometry that we, which we can distinguish well these two types of cells due to different size scattering signals, diploid cells with a high size scattered and non-calcified cells with a low size scatter. We see that the culture start expressing genes related with calcification, for example, all indicating that they are reverting back. And interestingly, they also lose the resistance to the virus. So if now you take this culture and you add the virus, the, the decoupled cells, they remain and they keep growing, but the calcified cells, the, the cohort of calcified cells, they, they are cleared out. So they lose the, the, the ability to, to resist to, to the virus. And uh, so this is uh, some of the developments that we, we have been working on on the, on the last years and in trying to understand what might regulate this process, trying to understand both how this uh, transition uh, happens. We know that they are able to form these decoupled cells under viral infection. We know that they are able to revert, but now we want to understand what are the, the real, the, the, or we want to understand better the timing for these processes. So this is some of the efforts we have been making, but also to understand what are the triggers what, what regulates uh, the, these transitions. And uh, this is not necessarily easy because uh, these organisms, we don't have uh, genetic tools to manipulate them or to knock down or, or overexpress genes that have been able to tackle some of the questions. So one of the things that we, uh, we have been working recently is trying to at least characterize them uh, both physiological but also in terms of uh, gene regulation to try to understand more uh, how different are they, how similar to each other are they, and maybe we can get some insights into the mechanisms both of transition but also of viral resistance. So together with uh, my student uh, Shai, uh, we did a comparative transcriptome and uh, which I will not develop in, in extent because it's still material that we are working on and trying to understand what are the differences. Again, this is an, another uh, limitation. The, 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 the amount of understanding of this genome, the, the understanding of these genomes is not, uh, is, it's quite uh, remote still. Many genes that we don't know what, what they are doing or a large fraction of genes which we don't understand. Also difficulties in, in trying to, to, uh, to assemble and to, and to annotate these genomes. But what we can clearly see is that the haploid cells are similar to the decoupled cells in terms of gene expression under regular exponential growth. Okay? They are more similar, they, they, which, which is what uh, we would expect. And, uh, and, uh, but there are also similarities. So now what I show here is a Venn diagram of the three transcriptomes with a large fraction of, of genes that are shared. And this will include photosynthetic genes and, and many other housekeeping genes that are used by a regular photosynthetic cell. But there is overlap 
or unique overlaps between each one of them. And as you can see here, there are also genes that are shared between the diploid and the decoupled that are not shared by the haploid. So the, this decoupled cell retains some properties of the dip, of diploid cells uh, uh, and uh, uh, that are smaller with, with the properties that it shares with the haploid cells. So they are more similar, uh, the, the decoupled and the haploid. And uh, so while we are understanding this, uh, trying to, to work on these genomes and trying to recognize the differences and what, 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 uh, what we can learn from it, uh, this type of information is also very useful because now, as you can see here, we can also pinpoint some genes that may be uh, life phase specific, okay? and that now we can use both in experiments, but uh, taking it to the field and use them as, as uh, to probe natural populations and try to, to see if different phases co coexist during these blooms, if the formation of decoupled cells correlates with natural infections in the natural environment, uh, and so on. And uh, as I said before, while we know a lot about the presence and the distribution of diploid calcified cells, we know nearly nothing about uh, the non-calcified cells in oceanic conditions. The very few information that we have is from work also that I did during uh, my PhD using a Emiliani Axley specific probe coupled with a polarized microscopy so that I could, I could recognize calcified and uncalcified cells. And I could see during blooms, so this is again a bloom in one of these mesocosms uh, that is being terminated again by viral infection. And in the background, I could detect non-calcified cells that then rise during the decline of the, of the bloom, similar to what I would expect from my culture experiments. So we know that non-calcified cells uh, do exist in the environment. They seem to be formed particularly, or at least some of them, during viral infection, which, which makes sense with our physiological work, which we, we just don't know yet uh, their ploidy level in natural conditions. And hopefully these markers that we have been developing from transcriptome work will be able to uh, take a step further and try to understand where are the different phases, what they are doing, and where they are going, how these populations develop after the bloom. This is part of the work that we are doing currently, uh, taking part of uh, cruises to sample these blooms, and, or, or also non-bloom conditions, and using transcriptomic approaches and also cellular approaches to try to detect different phases and correlate with environmental parameters, including viral infection. Uh, so one of the questions that uh, that uh, we ask ourselves, and often people also ask, is is this uh, Emiliani Axley just a, a freak cell? Is this unique to to Emiliani Axley? This ability to decouple the phenotype from the from the ploidy level, and the answer is probably not. There are some work uh, develop. Uh, over the, over the years, working with other aptophytes, uh, including work by uh, Daniel Volo in, in Roscoff, that show that some strains of non-calcified aptophytes that are uh, related to cocodophores, they also show uh, in culture stu studies and apparently without viral infection, the ability to decouple the phenotype from the ploidy level. So this seems to be a general feature of the aptophytes, but probably not only. There are other examples, of, and maybe one of the most studied examples in the al algae world is ectocarpus, uh, which is a model uh, macroalgae, brown macroalgae, where the decoupling between phenotype and diploidy has been also recognized. And, uh, and this process of decoupling is called apomixis, so it gen is a general process that has been described for uh, mostly for organisms that have such aplodiplontic life cycles. They have the ability to transition between two phases. And it seems that uh, the ability to decouple ploidy and, and the phenotype might be widespread. And this 
phenomenon is called apomixis, where apogamy is the formation of haploid cells without gamete fusion and apospory, the asexual formation of diploid cells. And this seems to be, in, at least from what we understand, mediated by genetic or epigenetic mechanisms. And this is one of the directions where we are going. Unfortunately, as I said, we cannot genetically mani manipulate Emiliani Axley really to test uh, if some gene, homologue genes that they retain in their genome that uh, mediate such process in, for example, ectocarpus play a role. So this is a limited, limiting step that we're trying to overcome uh, using other strategies. And so uh, this is what I have to say about the life cycle of Emiliani Axley. Another aspect that we have, have learned from the genome, and I just want to highlight, although this is a little bit off topic, is that uh, recently we did a work uh, showing that uh, cocodophores, like probably all uh, phytoplankton, with probably exception of diatoms, they are phagomizotrophic, so not only they uh, uh, do photosynthesis, but they are also able to prey on uh, marine bacteria under specific conditions. So you can see in this image, this has been work uh, of my student Joav, with using uh, fluorescently labeled bacteria. We see multiple species of cocotophores eating bacteria, so they are able to do it. And one of the interesting things that we also could see in these transcriptome that we did is that if we now uh, use uh, gene-based predictive models, we, we can see clearly that Emiliania Huxley has uh, the gene, gene repertoire or, or that uh, affiliates it mostly with mixotrophic organisms and even heterotrophic. So this confirms our observations that the genes for phagomixotrophy are retaining Emiliani Axley and it's clearly a phagomyxotrophic organism in contrast with purely photosynthetic organisms uh, like diatoms. So this is a confirmation and is one of one type of information that we can we could extract uh, from these uh, transcriptomes. So this this again has been work that was done by my student Shai with in collaboration with a friend from the United States, John Burns, at the Bigelow Laboratory. And with that, I, again, thank you very much for the opportunity. Also thank my students and the fund funding agencies. And uh, if you have questions, please. Thank you very much, Miguel. Maybe I went too fast. I don't know. I didn't time myself. No, no, we started a little bit earlier. That was very good. Thank you. I'm just checking if there is any hand rise in the audience. In the meantime, I have a question. Um, you already mentioned that the virus infection is the main cause of the demise of the IHAS blooms. But uh, uh, state, I, I will not say is the is the is the most important, but it, it appears to be a main mm -hmm. player on this on this demise. Yeah. And uh, have you seen? similar haploid diploid changes in response to bracing pressure for instance i didn't see i mean i did not work a lot with the uh, grazers but the work that i've done I, I did not see such type of transitions although there are other works that show that uh, the responses of haploid and diploid cells to grazing in, in lab conditions is also different seem that haploid tend to be also uh, more resistant to, to, to some virus, possibly due to activation of some, of some anti grazing mechanism. But we don't know much more than that, as, as far as I understand. Okay, thank you. There is a question back here as well. Uh, let me ask you to unmute and then. So, Tada, if yeah. you want to. This is Tadashi. Tadashi? Yeah. Uh, I have a question about how the virus infect the cell. Did you hear me? Uh, not, not very well. Can you repeat maybe? Yeah. How, the, how does the virus infect the cell? Uh, what, what do you mean? The, how does it 
that's, how the, the process of the infection of the virus? Well, it's it's quite uh, it's difficult to explain in in, in shortly, but uh, we still don't know exactly to what the this virus absorbs to. What is the receptor? We don't we don't know. Uh, it seems that. Uh, might bind to some receptors in in uh, in uh, yeah but uh, you're answering about the genes and molecules but uh, what i'm asking is the structure of the cell the surface structure of the knee n and uh, the couple cells and uh n cell may be different the what the what sorry i i the surface structure the, of the cell. Of the cell, the, the cell surface. Yeah, that's right. It, it might, it, it, it might be. Uh, yeah. Did you observe those cells under electron microscopy, something? Uh, well, in, 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 in electron microscopy, we can see, for example, that diploid cells have these coccolids, but then they are uh, naked underneath. Yeah. While the, haplo the haploid and the decouple, they are not calcified, but have, uh, they, they are covered with uh, what we call organic scales. Yeah, so the, the, structure, the surface structure is similar between those, the couple cells and the... The, the, the surface okay. will be different. We don't know very well what is the biochemical mm. difference. Okay, uh, let me ask you another question. If you, Maybe. If you remove calcium, from Nian cells, does it uh, change the sensitivities for the virus? It seems that uh, it, it actually uh, enhances the absorption because uh, the virus can bind to the coccolids and it seems that there are some evidence that coccolids can serve as a decoy. So mm. naked, naked strains, they tend to, to, to be highly infected as well. So there may be some interaction between calcium and the virus? Uh, po possibly, possibly, but, but, okay. but both are infected. Okay, thank you very much. So, there is another question here by Daniel. Hi, uh, Miguel. <laughs> nice, very nice talk. And I did not remember this paper with uh, Bent. <laughs> uh, my question is more about the, uh, the grazing, actually because uh, this is very interesting. And uh, what's really fascinating is that you find that the transcriptome uh, match the, uh, the grazing. But I have one point, I mean, or one or two questions that I will uh, just formulate them together. Do you have, uh, first, why do you think that the grazing that you measure is so low so in, term of, in term of percentage of cells? Yeah, yeah, the mixotrophy, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I, I don't know. Um, we, we, the published work was done with uh, non-exenic cultures and uh, for, for some, and we were having a hard time to axonize them. And we thought that such low grazing was because they were just eating other bacteria and avoid and, and just uh, statistically, they would encounter less frequently our label bacteria. But uh, uh, we finally could axonize some cultures and we could also see low grazing. It, it might be that we just did not find the right uh, conditions for enabling grazing. I mean, we, we tried phosphate limitation against, uh, against uh, control, also something that is not published, we also Try the uh, under dark conditions, but we didn't see a, a major, a major ability to graze comparable to with other aptophytes. So one of the controls that we used was uh, uh, chrysochromilina, that we, it's well defined as a phagomyxotroph. And while chrysochromilina was eating much more and under the same conditions, the cocotophores were not. Uh, we still don't know why they eat so little. We know that they can eat, we observe it many times, or every time we do an experiment, but it's, it's rare. And yeah, we still did not manage to figure out uh, 
it's maybe a, a condition thing or, or maybe they, they rely less on, on disability. I don't know. Okay, thank you, very nice. But we, we, we did uh, some uh, confocal microscopy and we clearly see the, the, the bacteria inside ingested. So it's not some sort of artifact. We, we know the, the ingested bacteria is inside, so it was engulfed, but we don't know why they eat so little. Okay, thank you. Okay, so maybe we'll move to the next speaker. If you okay. want to stop uh, sharing, thank you very much, Miguel. Thank you. And if you want to start, Antonia, sharing your screen, please. Antonia. Okay. Is our next speaker. She's a PhD student uh, here in New Zealand, uh, jointly in the University of Otago in Dunedin and uh, at Niwa. And her PhD focuses on um, phytoplankton diversity and ecology in the Southern Ocean and the Ross Sea. And today he'll be, she'll be presenting some of her preliminary results. So okay. whenever you... Okay, thank you for the opportunity to present part of the work that I'm doing on my PhD. Today I will be talking about phytoplankton diversity across two contrasting oceanographic regions of the Southwest Pacific. So as a context, the Southern Ocean is the largest high nutrient low chlorophyll regions of the oceans. This means that despite the high abundance of macronutrients in the water, uh, the primary production and the phytoplankton growth is still limited and this limitation comes mostly by iron. So under these HNLC conditions, we have the Campbell Plateau. The Campbell Plateau is a submerged continental platform that is southeast of New Zealand. And it has some characteristics that make it an interesting place of study. It's limited in the south by the sub-Antarctic front, which bring cool and fresh water to the plateau and in the north but the subtropical front, which bring uh, iron-rich waters to the plateau. So in a cruise done in April of 2017, uh, samples were collected inside the plateau uh, with the context that of previous observation that have observed higher chlorophyll concentrations and productivity in this region in comparison with surrounding waters. Um, and it has been hypothesized that this could be a natural aerofertilization fertilization due diffusion from the seafloor. So we collect samples on the Campbell Plateau and on the regions north of the plateau, uh, characterized by the subtropical front, and south of the plateau uh, with subantarctic waters. So uh, the main goal of this was to evaluate the differences in community composition due uh, natural iron alleviation in the Campbell Plateau in comparison with the HNLC water masses that surround the plateau. So we collect seawater from CTD and we use a combined approach. Um, for one side, we collect um, filters for a bulk uh, community analysis that see the total community. And from the other side, a flow cytometry sorting approach, which give a deeper look into the smaller fraction of the community, that is the pico and nano phytoplankton, that tend to be underrepresented in the book. We amplify the B4 region of the 18S RNA gene and analyze these sequences using the DADA2 pipeline and assign the taxonomy using the PR2 database. So as a first uh, result, at looking at surface community composition in the bulk and in the sorting, the main thing that come up is that the bulk is dominated by chloropicophysia, that is in orange, while the sorting is dominated by mammalophysia, that is in blue. And this was kind of a surprise because the chloropicophysia fit the size that was selected for the sorting. Uh, at looking at patterns by region, we can see that the north uh, shows a higher abundance of dinophysia and small eukaryotes. The Campbell Plateau shows a dominance of chlorapicophysia in the book and diatoms in the sorting that were mostly fragiliaropsis. 
and the subantarctic zone a higher abundance of primnesiophysia in the certain that was mostly uh, feocystis. So this can give some hints that the idea of iron alleviation in the Campbell Plateau could influence on the higher presence of middle-sized diatoms uh, in this region. So at comparing this DNA-based approach with other typical techniques to assess taxonomy uh, as pigment-based uh, techniques, the first things that come to mind is that the DNA-based technique brings a higher resolution in comparison with pigments. Since in this image here, we can see that there's basically no match differences among stations. And also while comparing this, uh, the taxonomy assigned by uh, pigment base with DNA, because of the main uh, dominant group would be pregnesiophytes, which can belong to the aptophyte division. And by comparing this with the reads uh, obtained by the book, we see that the main one uh, is chlorophyta. So this gives some highlights on the importance of combining different approach to describe complex natural communities. And just to finish, um, other type of data set that I'm currently working on, um, using the same approach of combining bulk and sorting based metabar coding on the oceanic region of the Ross Sea in a cruise that was done in 2018. I'm currently working also on a, a data set from the 2019 from another voyage to the Ross Sea. And we are preparing another voyage that will happen in January of 2021 also to the Ross Sea. So all these data set combined will give an interesting view of the phytoplankton diversity in this region of the Ross Sea. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonia. There'll be opportunity for questions in the, in the following uh, mm -hmm. parallel Zoom meetings. So now I just uh, hand it to Margaret. Okay, great. So our next speaker for the afternoon is Charmaine Young. She is currently a professor, an assistant professor at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. She previously did her PhD at Duke and has completed postdocs at MBARI and GEOMAR. And her lab now focuses on interactions between marine microbes and um, at different trophic scales and then how um, anthropogenic forces influence these interactions. And today she'll be talking about interactions between algae and their viruses. So Charmaine, please go ahead. Thank you for the introduction. Um, can you hear me well? Um, yes. So thank you for the invitation and hosting. It's my honor to present my work at the Electronic uh, Symposium of Protestology, Oceania and uh, Asia session. Today I'll tell you more about the interplay between green alga and um, parasites in the sea. Most of the work presented today was done when I was working with Alice Warden and Bari uh, in the States and Joma in Germany. So here's today online. I'll first briefly introduce you the marine microbial loop and the green alga uh, mammalophysi and how did we isolate new viruses that infect this group and the physiological responses of the host in terms of growth rates. Uh, finally, I'll tell you more about the um, genomic features of the newly isolated viruses and how we find out um, the spatial co-occurrence of bifidococcus hosts and viruses based on the uh, metagenomic data. Um, before going into details of my research, I'd like to give my most sincere thanks to my postdoc advisor, uh, Alice Warden, and all members in the Warden group. Uh, particularly Charles Bachi, uh, we conducted the research together and we recently submitted the work as co-first author and the manuscript is in revision. Uh, I'd also like to thank our collaborator Matt Sullivan and Kosula uh, and to all the funding agency. So I'm a microbial oceanographer. I'm really interested in the role of microbes in the ocean uh, about the chemical cycles. Microbes are the smallest, uh, but probably the most important living organisms uh, of the ocean, in the ocean. 
Here's the marine uh, food chain. You can see the microbes form the base um, of the marine food chains and support the fishery which human rely for food. The microorganisms are fundamentally a uh, different way of making a living. Um, uh, bacteria here can be uh, hydrotrophic, which means they use organic carbon as food. They are really important in remineralization of organic nutrients to inorganic form, which then can be uh, used by phytoplankton. Some bacteria can be uh, autotrophic, uh, for example, cyanobacteria can carry out photosynthesis. A key is the other uh, important domain in the microbial uh, world. When we think of microbes, uh, most people, hopefully not today's audience, would uh, forget that microbes also consist of protists, which also have different nutrition modes. Um, uh, phytoplankton and uh, picophytoplankton are important primary producers. Diatom and Mammalophysi, uh, green algae, uh, important members from this group that I've worked uh, on. Uh, but today I focus on Mammalophysi. They are also um, they also have a trophic protist, which need to eat other uh, organisms or degrading organic matter. There's also the interesting group uh, mesotrophs, um, which can consume other cells as well as making their own food from light. And we cannot forget about viruses, although uh, they are considered to be living, they are not considered to be living entities. Um, uh, they are really important in the biogeochemical cycle. Um, all these, so they, they infect and kill organisms and release the nutrients back into the ocean. So all these members um, together form the microbial loop, uh, which involves different pathways of carbon and nutrient cycling through microbial comp components in the ocean. So we still have a lot to learn about the identity, physiology, and interaction, as well as the ecological processes they uh, that they mediate. And in this talk, I'll focus on the mortality of the green algae, um, Mammalophysi. So what are they? Uh, Mammalophysi are tiny algae, uh, less than two micron in size, similar as E. coli in your gut. They have huge uh, photosynthetic organelle. Uh, this organism that we all call Mammalophysi have some fundamental differences. For example, the left one, uh, Bifococcus, has scales on its surface, but the other two are naked. Bifococcus and Micromonas um, uh, can be found uh, from tropic uh, up to the polar system. Uh, but Australococcus has a more uh, restricted distribution, mostly found in mesotrophic uh, coastal water. From the scale bar, uh, you can tell that uh, Micromonas uh, is a bigger cell. So uh, when we are thinking in terms of Reynolds number, the cell size would affect the surface area to volume ratio and uh, nutrient uptake. Only Micromonas is small type but not the others. Uh, so morph uh, morphologically, uh, we can tell that different groups of Mammalophysi, but you can say a lot about them based on these uh, PM photos. Um, and actually with the Micromonas from Travic to Polar, there are completely different Micromonas species. Uh, when you look more detailedly at these organisms, uh, 18S RNA gene, we can actually see there are multiple different species within each group. We have been very interested in understanding uh, the forces of mortality acting on this um, uh, phototrophic protest. Uh, of course, there could be grazing, uh, but here I'm focusing on viral uh, mortality. These are great models to study um, uh, viral mortality because they are in culture and their number of viral sequences as shown here. Well, it is well established that Micromonas and Australococcus each have a high um, genetic diversity and multiple distinct uh, genetic clades or species as illustrated in the phylogenetic tree. Uh, Micromonas uh, has a list clade A, B, C, D, and E. Uh, but for a long time, we think that there is only one species under uh, Bifococcus based on the 18S marker gene. But through working in the uh, field together with uh, metagenomics, researchers have discovered uh, two different uh, Bifococcus groups, and I'll call them um, uh, B1 and B2 clays. Uh, while the two Bifococcus clays has identical um, um, 18S uh, RNA gene, 
uh, when we look at the internal transcribed uh, space sequence, ITS, the differences in the ITS sequence between the KB1 and KB2 is big enough to be considered appropriate for species destination. As shown here, uh, in the ITS2 of the nuclear encoded RNA trans uh, transcriptional unit, uh, universal uh, HELIS1 of B1 contain, plate B1 contains a 10 um, nucleotide loop, but not the other plate. So not only genetically, the two groups are very uh, different, but also you can see the two groups live in very different waters. Here, uh, we are looking at the salinity on the x-axis and temperature on the y-axis. Um, B2 is more abundant. Um, in warmer and more saline oligotrophic giant water, while in the lower salinity and cooler um, water, we mostly just found a B1 group. It is important for oceanographers to know what shape their niches, and in fact, when we look at the existing isolated viruses, uh, we, can, uh, we only have isolated viruses infected uh, against uh, B1 clade, uh, but not the B2 clade. So we wanted to isolate viruses for the beetle clade, which are more abundant in the open ocean. So Crawford and I uh, ran out to the oligotrophic uh, gyre in the Gaston Sea. Uh, we want to go somewhere that we should see B2 group, which should like uh, gyre water conditions. So that's why we picked this site. And here we use uh, classical virus isolation methods to, isolating, uh, to isolate viruses for the B2 Plate using a B2 host uh, LCC uh, 716. Uh, just a side note, the B2 strings are very difficult to culture in the lab, which makes it difficult to uh, isolate B2 clade viruses. So after going for a lot of dilutions and culture work, uh, we isolated three viruses that can infest the B2 clade. The TM photos show that all three B2 um, viruses have similar morphology to other categorized uh, personal viruses, uh, the virus that infect other green algae. They all, uh, they all have uh, icosahedral capsid, and the uh, diameters are between um, 120 to 140 uh, nanometer. Then I want to see what can these guys infect. So I grew up different uh, healthy mammalophysic cultures and infected uh, the happy culture with the three viruses. Um, I check every day and see if the happy culture turns clear. Uh, we suggest the virus lies the uh, whole cell. So I found that um, none of the none was able to infect uh, B1 strain, Australococcus, or Metamonas isolates tested, uh, suggesting these uh, B2 viruses. Uh, have a high degree of specificity to uh, Bifococcus K2. Um, so the LCC715 and LCC716 both are B2 clade, uh, but the three viruses cause different impacts uh, on the two strains. B2 V1 uh, lies uh, LCC715 um, uh, but the other two viruses only initially lies um, uh, 715. Uh, and the resistant 715 uh, population grow back five days later. So it is an interesting result as both uh, B2 strains were isolated from the water in the same nesting bottle in Indian Ocean. So I want to have a more detailed looks on the infection of the two uh, B2 strains uh, instead of just checking the, whether the culture remains green or turn clear, I sample the culture every two hours for 30 hours after adding the viruses. And then I counted the whole cells and uh, viral particle abundance using the, viral, uh, using the flow cytometer to look at the uh, infection dynamics. So here you're looking at the host uh, cell abundance on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis. Uh, we can see 10 hours after the addition of V1, uh, the whole cell numbers start to differ uh, from the gray control, uh, while it takes longer time to see a drop in uh, the host uh, num cell number in other viruses. V1 um, uh, uh, also has a bigger birth size and shorter latent period. Uh, you may notice that the MOI uh, multiplic um, multiplicity of uh, infection 
is much lower in uh, fee free. Uh, MOI uh, represents the ratio between infectious virus particle uh, to whole cells. I'm happy to talk about some of the caveats here or late, um, talk about it later. But the bottom line is that we can say that the fee one has a higher infectivity uh, than the fee two and uh, or than fee two on LCC 716. We repeated the same experiments with uh, 715. Uh, we found that uh, 715 continued to grow after the addition of V2, V2, and V3. Uh, only V2, V1 uh, lies the culture. This suggests that V1 has a higher infectivity as well as broader uh, infection range. Uh, this may have important ecological implications, but also arise more questions. How do the host uh, strain develop resistance? How do the virus evolve to such um, high specificity? Uh, would genome of the viruses tell us more about this, these processes? And therefore, we sequence the genomes of the three uh, B2 viruses. So the genome size of B2, B2 and B3 are similar, about 210 kilobases. Uh, both B2 and B3 can be assembled into one context. Uh, but B1, uh, B2 V1 genome was only 167 kilobases and comprised of four linear um, double stranded DNA scaffolds. Because the sample uh, was deeply sequenced, um, so we assume that repeat salmons were not resolved uh, during the assembly of, uh, of the V1. So um, the gene synteny is globally well conserved across the B2 viruses and also the uh, B1 viruses. The only limited rearrangement of the um, genome as shown in these uh, synteny blocks. B2 virus, virus genome uh, have 220 to 235 uh, putative open reading frames. And these three viruses uh, have 170 um, predicted proteins in common, which had about uh, 30 unique proteins as well as a few proteins shared by just of the two of the three viruses. Um, the 170 shared proteins uh, had higher amino acid identities between the V2 and V3 uh, than to V1, which matches the discrepancies in the infection dynamics observed in the uh, culture experiment. Um, after looking at the similarity among Bifococcus viruses, we want to compare the Bifococcus viruses to other personal viruses and study the evolutionary relationships among personal viruses. We extracted 22 uh, shared core proteins from the sequence genomes and compared them with the available green algal virus uh, genome. And here we constructed a robust phylogeny, um, including the three uh, new viruses. Uh, Great dots represent the bootstrap uh, value, supports values of 100%. So phylogenomic reconstruction grouped the three uh, Bifiococcus II uh, virus with the two um, Bifiococcus personal viruses belong, which belong to uh, plate one. Uh, this plate is fully supported based on, um, um, based on bootstrap value and it's branched uh, adjacent to the uh, large group of viruses that can infect uh, Macromonas osteococcus. Um, the clade of Bifiococcus virus segregated into um, two subclades um, with B2, uh, with uh, B2, V2, and B2, V3 uh, clustered together um, adjacent to uh, the uh, BP, V1, V2, and the B2, V1. Um, we need uh, more viruses belonging to the uh, B2, V1. Um, lineage to better position B2 V1 on this tree. Um, but our results suggest that uh, B2 V1 was more closely related to uh, Bifococcus racinal viruses uh, than the other uh, two um, uh, B2 viruses. Uh, in the last slide, the comparison was made uh, based on uh, 22 uh, core proteins. And here I'm comparing all the protein groups from the available personal virus genome uh, using alpha binder. Here's the hierarchical cut, uh, clustering based on the distribution uh, patterns of the proteins group uh, across all the personal virus. 
Uh, the clustering pattern is similar to that of the phylogenomic uh, tree based on the 22 core proteins in the previous slide. Um, and the color here showed the number of genes uh, in each protein group for individual test, uh, individual virus. Uh, white means um, uh, absence of that particular protein. Uh, the top bar here um, uh, show how many of the virus share that particular protein. Uh, while most of the proteins were found in more than one personal virus genome, uh, each, protein, uh, each uh, virus genome has 0 to 15% unassigned genes, which means none of the other personal virus share uh, the same gene. So the uh, Bayfield caucus uh, virus had a few protein encoding genes that are not identified in other personal viruses. Um, for example, each of the five uh, Bayfield caucus virus encoded the P2X receptor uh, in the uh, intracellular trafficking and secretion uh, category. In addition, uh, within the secondary metabolite category, uh, B2, uh, V2 and V3 encoded two proteins um, potentially involved in uh, degrading the aromatic compound um, into uh, acetyl-CoA. Uh, and uh, conversely, uh, proteins involved in uh, energy production and conversion, such as uh, Glycophosphory, uh, diester phosphorus, uh, diesterase were found in eight other personal viruses, but absent from um, the Bayfield caucus viruses. Um, in general, we could not assign the functions of about 70% uh, Bayfield caucus viral genes uh, to a functional category. The apparent differences in the uh, evolutionary trajectory of B2, V1 uh, from that of the other two. Um, B2, V2, and B2, V3, uh, as observed in the phylogenomic and alpha group analysis, uh, pointed to possible differences in the host ranges and ecological impacts of the newly discovered uh, B2 viruses. But the underlying molecular mechanisms uh, still need further investigation. We then next asked whether the viruses isolated against two different Bifrococcus ecotypes uh, show similar distributions as the respective hosts in uh, the natural samples. It is well known that virus influence the ecology and evolution of their uh, eukaryotic host, but their diversity and distributions are still not well categorized. Um, therefore, we map the host and virus genome against the Terra Ocean dataset and study that distribution in the global uh, ocean. We recruited the risk from the two Terra uh, metagenome studies to Bifidococcus virus core genes, and then compare the distribution to the previously reported uh, relative abundance of Bifidococcus trait B1 and B2 risk in Terra data. Um, while one or both um, Bifidococcus traits were detected in all um, metagenomes that we analyzed, uh, their res respective B1 and B2 viruses uh, were detected in only uh, 31 out of the 54 with corresponding virus. So this map is showing the Terra Ocean sampling site, um, and um, it's, um, it's also show where the host and the virus were detected. And the right plot here uh, shows a very nice correspondence in many cases between the host and the viral group. The label uh, outside matches the uh, station number on the map, a uh, solid line represents uh, the host and the dotted line represents the virus. Uh, yet, we do have uh, this area that, uh, uh, that have some overlapping. For example, um, uh, stations 78 uh, suggesting that it's either these uh, viruses can cross infect other hosts or something else. And so we stop and we look at the oceanographic conditions and you can see that uh, these stations are in the uh, convergence zone. So station 78 located on the South um, Atlantic convergence zone. And there's mixing of different water mass type, which could explain why we could find both mesotrophic and oligotrophic uh, group uh, there. Um,
number five viruses. One, um, one, one virus is uh, dominant, and the others is as a much lower um, uh, abundance. This is consistent with the bank model, suggesting only a small fraction of a virus community is active and abundant at any given time, while most um, while most populations are rare and dominant. Forming a seed bank that can kill the winner when the host reach a critical abundance threshold. This is the additional uh, complexity that we need to think about in the future. So to conclude, our studies illustrates the value of uh, combining culturing, genome analysis, and physiology um, research with metagenomic studies. Well, it is well known that viruses influence the ecology and evolution of the uh, protist host. It is known about the protist host virus um, diversity and distribution in the marine ecosystem. Uh, we have isolated and categorized uh, unexplored open ocean uh, presinoviruses, generated genome sequences from the newly discovered Bifilococcus um, viruses. Uh, this new virus genome, together with the existing Bifilococcus genome, um, allow us to connect the host and virus uh, dynamics to the environmental conditions and niche, uh, niche special, uh, specialization. Uh, moreover, the high uh, infection uh, specificity of the B2 viruses and their uh, environmental positioning illustrate that uh, microdiversity is important for modeling host virus uh, dynamics and uh, about geographic uh, geography across the global uh, ocean. Um, so I just moved back to Hong Kong last year, uh, building my own research group. So uh, I'm still recruiting PhD and postdoc. And um, so my, my current work also um, is looking, one of my current work is also looking at the uh, green algae and virus in the Hong Kong water. So I've been working with a collaborator from CNRS in France, uh, Gennel Pignol. Uh, we have isolated personal virus from the Hong Kong water. This is our station is around here on the picture. Uh, and this is our campus. Uh, we have yet to, and my PhD student, um, Yang Bin, has uh, isolated some green alga culture. So, but we have not uh, yet characterized their physiological and genomic features. So hopefully next time I can tell you more about the green algae and the viruses from a totally different marine system. So with that, um, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Okay, we, we have um, time for a few questions. I just want to remind everybody that you can ask questions either by raising your hand electronically or by um, typing your question into the chat box in case you don't have a microphone or don't want to talk. Um, so if anybody has a question, they can go ahead and raise hands or type in the chat box. And while people are getting their questions together, um, I have a question to get us started with. Um, this might be a little bit naive. I've never gone hunting for viruses before, but um, it seems kind of amazing to me that you were looking for a specific type of virus and then you were, you were able to isolate three different viruses that were specific to the organism of your interest. Mm -hmm. I was wondering um, how, how much um, do you think this represents the total diversity? Do you think there's a lot more viruses out there that are specific um, to the algae that you're working with, or do you think that you have um, sampled most of the viral diversity that is out there? Uh, I think there's probably like much more diverse diversity out there in the ocean, because um, we are just using the uh, culture, the green algae culture that can be grown in the lab, so you're already biased to, to that. And then with this method, we definitely can, I think we can only um, get Samples the more abundant uh, viruses, um, and also we can only um, isolate the viruses where the host is uh, in high abundance. Because, like, I mean, the, the when we assume that the abundance of the uh, virus and uh, the host to be um, relatively uh, corresponding to each other. Um, so, um, but because I thought that actually. It's, 
um, cause the, like in this project, like the isolation part was not done, was done by my co-author. Um, so like he has concentrated a lot of water uh, from the open water um, to, to isolate the, the viruses. But actually, if you're looking in the coastal water, um, it's much easier than I uh, expected because I've been uh, working with Ganao Alpino. Uh, so we basically just add, like filter the water from from the from the um, uh, uh, from the water, the seawater, like, and add one meal to the um, culture, and then we just like sit and see what's going on, and then we're still able to. Like some some cultures are lies, so but we are we we just had that like experiment going like two weeks ago, so we don't know um, the diversity yet. But I would say that probably there'll be a lot out there, and also um, I'm like also working with the um, metagenomic data, so we can also look at the diversity based on there. But with that data, it's difficult to match the host and virus. So I think CCR the other way back. Thank you. Um, There's no hand, right? I don't see a hand. There's a question in the chat that was typed while you were speaking. I'm not, I'm not sure if it was for you or for the previous speaker, um, mm -hmm. but Annie Lynn Tampas wrote, um, in phytoplankton diversity sampling, what are the problems that are encountered and how do you manage to overcome them? Um, I don't know if Annie Lynn is, is out there or if you want to comment on that question since you've done some phytoplankton diversity <laughs> sampling. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess like for the, I mean, cause these days I'm microbiology is just always, not always, but like focus a lot of the uh, omic data, like the, the market gene or the metagenome sequencing. Um, so we discovered a lot of diversity uh, based on that, but then, um, but I think it's still failure, like it's, it's still, um, the culturing was still have a lot of failures because like you can actually do the experiments to understand uh, the mechanisms um, using the model system and you can always like use the, data generated from the uh, model system, uh, match it back to the um, uncultured diversity uh, discovered in the um, market gene or metagenome data. Sure. Um, PLG has their hand up. Um, I'm sorry, it's probably not your actual name, but that's what it says in the chat. Oh, so it's, uh, it's Puri Lopez Garcia. So yes, it's uh, <laughs> some my name, but it's too long. So thank you for a nice talk. My question has to do with um, the specificity. So have you identified generalist viruses and do you think that they are there? And if they are there, uh, how to detect them? Can you go for them uh, in a more specific way? Like, did you ask, like, I, can you repeat the first part of the question, sorry? I'm, I'm asking about generalist viruses, viruses that are not that specific of particular okay, strain. General. Mm -hmm. What do you know about them? Do they exist for these uh, algae and uh, microalgae and, and uh, how to detect them or look for them? Because maybe you are selecting for more specific viruses, but I don't know. Do you have yeah, any so, information about yeah, yeah. the genetic So they're, they're like more general uh, viruses. Um, for example, with like, like, I think that the viruses that can infect both uh, Australococcus and Micromonas, like has been um, discussing the, has been showing in the literature. Uh, for this specific project, we are looking at the Bifidococcus, so um, we focus on that. But as you can see, like we did like cross, like, like even though we use the Bifidococcus uh, strain to isolate viruses from the uh, environments, but then we still do a cross infectivity test. So if it's like a more general viruses, then it should be detected there, uh, I mean there. And so then for, for my current project, then we use like multiple different um, um, green algal strains to do the isolation. And once we get the uh, virus lysate, then we will um, do the cross infection and see uh, the, the, uh, the range. But I'm and sure so that 
there are like more general. Um, yeah, terms, so. and uh, well, my, I guess that my the next question was: uh, Do you find what kind of genomic differences can you find between generalists of specific viruses, or is there anything any molecular determinant underlying the generalist function rather than the specialist function? So, mm -hmm. I guess you know something about that. Can you tell something? That's a really good question. Um, I don't think there's a, a comprehensive uh, research or comparison on that yet, because still, like, even though we may know that, okay, this is a more general one, uh, like, even like, if, like among the, 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 the free viruses that are isolated, like, it seems like the range is also different among them, but then because uh, a lot of the genes um, cannot be assigned a function, like, it's difficult to tell, okay, why they are different. Uh, what's the difference between the general and the specialist? But okay, it will be you. good to study in the future. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Charmaine, so much. We're going to move on to the next speaker now. Um, so if um, Hyun Bin, you can share your, your screen, please. Okay. So um, I'll just start with the introduction since the next talk is a lightning talk. So our next speaker is, is Hyun Ben Lee. She's a graduate student in Jansu Park's lab at Kyungpuk National University in South Korea. And her, her research interests include bacteria and protists in hypersaline environments, transcriptomics, and isolating marine archaea. And she will be talking about at least two out of three of those research interests today. So go ahead. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Thank you for giving me this opportunity to present my study. Let me start by introducing myself. I'm Hyun Bin Lee. I'm a graduate student at Microbial Oceanography Laboratory in Gyeongbuk National University of Korea. And today I'm going to talk about biodiversity patterns of uncultured eukaryotes in hypersaline environments using the Illumina platform with two different biomarkers. The goal of this study is to identify of the biodiversity of hypersaline environments using a culture independent method and to evaluate the stu uh, evaluate of stability of the two biomarkers in hypersaline environments for the first time. Uh, it is uncertain where we collected the samples is located on the west coast of South Korea. And we collected the water samples from is uncertain in April, June, and August 2019. The salinity of the water sample we collected ranged from 21 uh, to 388 ppt. The water samples were filtered as they were collected on the site. Then the used filter papers were carried back to the laboratory for DNA extraction. After DNA extraction, the extracted nucleic acid were sequenced using Illumina MySTIC platform with two different biomarkers uh, for V4 and V9 region the, of the 18S RDNA. Finally, the reads were clustered into operational taxonomic unit uh, with 90, uh, at 97% identity. Now let's move on to the results. The table on the left side indicates the results of the sequencing obtained by the using the two different biomarkers. And uh, the right side, this table includes the number of the OTU along the salinity gradients. The number of read counts and the OTU or with V9 primer is higher than with V4 primer, and species richness it, uh, does not decrease with increasing salinity. This figure, uh, which based on filtered read counts, uh, shows the relative fraction of major eukaryotic group along the salinity gradients. As you can see here, uh, the overall distribution patterns between the V4 and V9 is, are almost identical. There are some exceptions though. 
Uh, the dominant taxonomic groups are ciliate, Genaliella species, Artemia species, and Streaminopars. In previous study using other methods like clone library, uh, all of these were known as dominant groups in high salinity water. Interestingly, the rare biosphere like heterogosia in excavates was only detected by uh, using uh, the V9 uh, biomarkers because of the bias of the primer. This is why we used the uh, two different biomarkers. And compared to another study, a lot of heterogosia were previously isolated and cultured at 300 ppt of hypersaline environments. But in our study, ciliate were predominant group at 300 ppt and heterogosia was uh, rarely detected. So in summary, the salinity may not be a critical factor affecting the biodiversity in hypersaline environments and predominant groups appear differently between the culture dependence and culture independent method at 300 ppt. Uh, rare biospheres such as excavates only detected by culture independent method using the V9 biomarker. That it is more appropriate to use the V9 biomarker for revealing the biodiversity of the extent eukaryotes in hypersaline environments. And that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was a perfect lighten talk.